Hey there, thanks for tuning in. You ready for another episode of my Bigfoot sighting? All right then, let's do this. Seen a bunch of run-down new horse towns Where the church is the backbone, loves and the plow And the five-string melodies groove in With the farmland rows where the roots run deep Beyond the noise of the busy streets Where the songs of the south are soothing When I hear the front porch picking down Home rhythm ringing out I don't run from banjo music If you'd like to be able to listen to the show without ads and have full access to bonus content, that's an option. To find out how, please go to MyBigfootSighting.com. My Bigfoot sighting started while I was visiting Sedona to try and research UFOs, oddly enough. Uh, I really didn't expect to encounter more than one strange phenomena in the same location, but that's really the way it happened. I was coming out here uh, after being friends with a man named John Lear for a long time. John and I would talk, you know, for hours on end about everything strange and bizarre. And he would encourage me to go and take a boots on the ground approach to the phenomena. He would tell me, you can't just read about it. You got to go try to find places where these things are so you can have the experiences and learn from the experience itself. And I really wanted to see a UFO and I determined Sedona was the easiest place to do that. And it is, but I was coming back year after year on camp trips just to watch UFOs and study them. And I would bring friends. It would get more difficult to bring friends, actually, because, you know, you tell people, hey, you want to come camping in tents, watch UFOs and then go to sleep in your tent. It freaks them out a little bit after they've seen a UFO fly overhead. So I did have these two friends with me and, you know, we would stay up late looking at the night sky and all three of us are avid campers that have camped our whole lives and we're very familiar with the woods and animals and you know how they sound and smell and move and so one night we were up pretty late it was maybe two or three in the morning and we're camping about eight miles out of sedona and we went to the end of the campsite where the tree line to the forest is and we're right along the creek on oak creek and we decided we would just kind of throw out some wood knocks and do some Bigfoot calls. And we were doing it more just for our own entertainment purposes. You know, we had seen the shows of people doing that. We had never done them ourselves. We thought that would be kind of just fun. So at the end of the campground, we got some sticks. Actually, they weren't even sticks. I had bought wooden baseball bats to use to make wood knocks because I knew that was really hard wood. So we did some wood knocks and then we did our best attempt at, you know, some Bigfoot whoops and some calls by no means professionals at that. So we didn't expect to get any kind of result at all. And then suddenly all three of us, we were overpowered by a smell and it was so strong this thing had to have been within 20 feet of us and we couldn't see more than five feet out from us because it was really dark and it was dense with trees but the smell all three of us tried to describe it afterwards the best description we can give is burnt tires dead bodies and burning hair all mixed up together i mean the most wretched it made our eyes water shut we were dry heaving and it lasted about about a minute after that the smell completely vanished so it wasn't like a dead skunk i mean it didn't really smell skunky but that was the first sign to me that oh maybe there's something more going on out here and as time went on the years went on you know friends couldn't always come camping with me and it was the first year i came out alone that things really went kind of to the next level i still wasn't expecting a bigfoot experience i was out here for 10 days and 
I wanted to find some old petroglyphs of a spiral just for my own, you know, personal reasons. I think the spiral petroglyph is interesting. It's all across the world. And I know there's a lot of those type of things out here. So I found a picture on a very old, obscure forest ranger forum. And it showed a picture of a spiral petroglyph. And it showed on a map the forest road you could take and the dry creek bed where this thing was. I really didn't have many plans. It was raining all night. Uh, the rain stopped early in the morning. I got up about seven, I think, and decided, okay, I'm just going to see if I can find this road, this dry creek, see if I can find a spiral. Um, when I got down there, it's a real rocky place. It's uh, like watermelon sized river rocks on the bottom the walls on each side of it are maybe 30 feet high and they're they're fairly vertical walls it's a very u-shaped dry creek and i started walking around and i started finding a lot of petroglyphs i did see some spirals but the one that struck me the most was a drawing of it had people it had drawings of natives and in the middle of the natives was a creature twice as tall as them. Next to the creature's feet, they carved in large footprints, petroglyphs of footprints. And the large creature was holding a deer by the head. And I took pictures of it, and I didn't quite realize what I was looking at at first. It, you know, it looked very strange. Them carving a footprint was weird. But I took some pictures of it, and then it was really hot down there. It was probably like almost 120 degrees. I was just about out of water. I had more water in my car, so I decided I was going to turn back. When I turned back, I was turning into the wind. And when I turned into the wind, I caught that smell again. That same smell from the campground. At this point, I'm about 10 miles from the camp. I was staying in the same campground, but alone this time. And the smell when I caught it in the wind was more distant. It wasn't as close, but I could tell exactly what the smell was. And I panicked for just a couple seconds because I thought to myself, oh my God, I'm alone. I'm in the middle of nowhere. And there's a giant creature down here with me. And so I figured, okay, calm down, retrace your steps, just see if you can find something. So I started walking. I got to all the way to the point where I started and I didn't see anything. And then it was just kind of my uh, intuition. So just go a little bit further. And so I went a little bit further, maybe 30 or 40 feet. Over to the left was a sandy area. Now, there was a little bit of rainwater collected there, but the track wasn't in the rain. The track was following me in my direction. And this footprint in the sandy part was a good 14 inches long, um, maybe five, six inches wide. I could take off my Adidas hiking shoe and fit it inside the bare footprint. And it was also on a hill. And the weight of this thing, it made a flat footprint on the hillside. So one side of the track was uh, deeper than the other side. And looking at the impressions I made at the time with my backpack, I was about 200 pounds. I mean, this thing had to weigh 800 pounds or more. And the gate, when I looked, so I, I was like on the verge of heat stroke when I saw it. I was kicking myself later that I didn't look for hairs or anything, but I did get pictures and video. Later that night, going through it, we realized there are prints of its knuckles in the ground. It put its foot and its hand down. And the craziest thing to me was I couldn't hear it. I mean, it followed me for over 100 yards. And... It's a very noisy place. It's all loose rocks and dry leaves and twigs and branches. And I heard nothing that whole time. For an 800 pound creature to move silently through an area like that started to make me realize that there's 
something more to this phenomena. Seeing that footprint, I knew all of a sudden these things are real. Oh my gosh, these creatures exist for real. I don't know what they are, but here it is right here. Here's a 14 inch ape track. And it only left one footprint. So that was like three to four feet on each side of the track with no track. So it had a really big step. I was a little bit rattled. So I went back to my campsite and figured I was just going to go on a little bit of a walk around the camp area. And I was walking around and I found this kind of field and kind of walked through the field and went to the other tree line. And when I got to the other tree line, there was this weird kind of um, opening area that looked like a, kind of like a den. And in the middle of it was a deer skeleton. And the deer's back leg had been broken by being twisted off. Now, it was there. I have pictures of the bone. And you can see the bone like a... Uh, like a corkscrew on the end from where something grabbed the deer's leg and twisted it off. I went and asked some rangers nearby, you know, Hey, what's out here that can take down a deer. And, you know, they said there's a mountain lion every now and then that comes down from the, from the top up there. But, uh, you know, maybe it got hit by a car and well, the deer wasn't anywhere near a road. And I can't imagine it walked that far with a leg that was broken like that. So, it's a little bit hard to say, but I've heard that's how the Sasquatch creature hunts. So that was a, a really bizarre day. Several things kind of happened that day. And on my return trips to that Dry Creek area, I have found so many more carvings of Bigfoot footprints. And I've been able to date them as well because they also carved a saber tooth cat. Now, those haven't been around for a long time. We're talking 10,000 years. So this little Dry Creek area had activity when these people were carving pictures of Bigfoot and carving its footprints in the rock 10,000 years ago. And it has activity now. That's the first place I've found a footprint. And it's still the best, most clear, obvious track I've found to date. And so that really made me addicted to coming out here. I was already into it for, you know, just researching UFOs. And I figured that was enough. Bigfoots would be a little much at this point. But I just said, okay, I don't know how to go about this yet. But I want to try to see if these things really are here. So I started looking around online and... You know, I, I wasn't seeing much. I was seeing some reports here and there of, you know, Bigfoot near Sedona. And, and then I caught wind of a guy named Tom Dongo. Now, he used to research a ranch out here that used to be called the Bradshaw Ranch. Him and Linda Bradshaw used to research it when she lived there. And there was a Bigfoot on their property. Uh, big girl. And... You know, they would feed it. Linda Bradshaw would interact with it. She would leave food out and it would leave little patterns of sticks on the ground and stuff for her. And so, you know, I was like, okay, there, there's somebody out here with some experience. I'm going to reach out to him. And I reached out to Tom and I wanted to ask him if he's heard of anything at the campground I was staying at. So I didn't tell him I encountered a Bigfoot. I was talking to him and said, hey, Tom. I'm staying at such and such campground. And he stopped me right away and said, oh, you are? He's like, that's funny. He's like, I haven't heard that, even the name of that campground in, in a while. But gosh, you know, maybe four or five years ago, I had people call me saying they had a Bigfoot run through their campground or their campsite in that same campground across through the creek. And I was like, Tom, that's why I'm calling you. <laughs> I'm calling you because we smelled it in that campground. So hearing that from Tom, that became my go-to campsite. The campground itself is wonderful, but I stay at the very, very end of the property, right on the creek. So there's no other campers for uh, maybe like a good 100, 200 yards some of the days. 
and it started happening more. I got up one morning and decided to look around, and sure enough, I found three big, heavy footprints coming over the little hill and going right into the creek. And I couldn't believe it. You know, I got video and pictures, and I actually got this older Native American guy that works on the campground. And I told him, hey, can you come by my campsite? I need to ask you a question. And he came over, and he's like, hey, what'd you need? And I brought him and showed him the track. And I said, what made this? And he turned into what looked like a ghost. I mean, the first things out of his mouth were, oh, my God, this thing is really heavy. Because this is really compacted ground and it's and gravelly and, you know, it's still left like a inch tr deep track in it. I mean, this is something that a 300 pound person doesn't leave impressions in. And you can tell it slipped when it was going into the creek. It's heel print. It double stepped. You can tell it slid and then took another step in the actual creek. It's all rocks. So there were no more tracks in the creek, but I, I couldn't believe that. I had an, another encounter. And so, you know, I didn't know what else to do other than just keep coming to the same place. And then the following year, I had a friend out there with me. Her name was Glau. She's from Brazil. And we were up late in the campsite. It was maybe 11 o'clock. I needed to go to the bathroom before I went to sleep. And so the bathrooms are about maybe a quarter mile walk. So I asked her if she'd be okay by the fire. I said, I'm going to the bathroom. When I came back, she was cowering in the tent. I went, I said, are you okay? And she was like, oh my God, I'm so glad you're back. And she said, maybe one or two minutes after I left, something on two legs came walking through the creek. She said it was big. She said she thought it was me coming back to try and scare her. Then she realized it was too big to be me. And being from Brazil, she didn't know what's around here. She thought it was a bear. And she went and hid in the tent. And I said, okay, well, there's no bears out here. And bears don't walk on two feet. She said, no, it was definitely walking on two feet. I could hear each foot as it walked through the water. And I didn't tell her that, you know, that's exactly what another group of campers there had claimed to have experienced. I said, that was, you know, that's pretty bizarre. We'll see if we can see anything. We didn't see any physical evidence. So I said, well, you know, I'm not going to leave you alone in camp again. <laughs> and the really cool thing that happened in camp was I had two people staying with me. I had ended up collecting so much video and photographs of Bigfoot tracks, other very strange cracks of other cryptids that are out here of ufos and we decided to make a free documentary on youtube about all this stuff just to share this phenomena and the evidence supporting it in the sedona area and if you're into this stuff and you want to have a chance to experience it i mean just schedule yourself a trip out here is my best suggestion but so if you go on youtube and you look up hoodoo tall h-o-o-d-o-o -O -O, space t-a-l-l -L. uh that's the name of the documentary and it's about three hours and 40 minutes so there's there's plenty in there for you to see and so i had the cameraman and this lady ashley who was filming with us for a couple days the three of us were in our tent and it was actually the last day we had filmed and it was maybe 10 11 o'clock at night again and all of a sudden we heard vocalizations from it for the first time this thing was grunting it was maybe 20 or 30 feet from the tent. And the first grunt really woke me up. I mean, it was a definitive, deep, bassy grunting. <clears throat> and I woke up immediately after me, the two of them woke up and they were like, what the heck was that? So I'm prepared to try to have an encounter with these things, but these two people are not. And so my immediate attention went to trying to de-escalate the situation instead of hey i'm going outside there's a bigfoot out there one uh, i've tried to do that before and friends are around they tend to not let you go over to where the bigfoot is so but after the first grunt all three of us were awake then it grunted again 
And now it was maybe 50 feet away from the tent. It was moving. Now, it wasn't making noise when it walks. And this was in the fall. It was dried leaves everywhere on the ground. No noise when it walks. And the sound was coming from about eight, nine feet off the ground. Now, when my two friends started panicking, I was trying to tell them it's javelina pigs. I was like, it's just, it's just pigs. It's just pigs. Now, this didn't sound anything like a javelina pig, but I didn't know what else to tell them. Now, the third grunt got even louder, and they pretty much knew we weren't dealing with pigs at that point. Uh, my camera guy had his loaded pistol out. I mean, he was ready to put around through the tent wall. And then I realized from dealing with these things, just turn the camera on. I mean, these things know when electronic devices are around and when they're on and when things are pointed at them. So instead of having him fire off around in the campground, I said, hey, 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 get your camera and turn it on. And he said, are you crazy? I'm not going out there with my camera. And I said, no, no, no. Turn it on so we get the audio. And he was like, oh, good idea. So he was reaching for his camera. I heard it grunting and groaning a fourth time, but this time it was already on the other side of the creek. He turned his camera on and then dead silence after that. Nothing else after he turned the camera on. And we were able to kind of just calm them down and, you know, kind of reset ourselves and just, you know, get back to sleep. But the weirdest part about the whole experience or many experiences out here is that Bradshaw Ranch. Now, I had seen a video Tom Dongo has... Uh, of a MUFON presentation he did. And I've never seen a collection of evidence like they gathered, especially all from one location. Bigfoots, UFOs, gray aliens, ghosts, live dinosaurs walking around. I mean, it, it all seems too much. And I wanted to see this place for myself, you know. And Tom told me, hey, you know, the activity there is dead. So, you know, you can go out there, but I don't think anything's happening. And this was probably four or five years ago now. And I decided, yeah, I just want to go. And the first time I tried to find it, I couldn't. And then I had to go on Google Earth and kind of was able to locate it and see where I needed to go to get there and stuff. And it's about an eight, nine mile dirt road from the highway. So, it, you know, it's not an easy trek by any means. But him and Linda Bradshaw, along with Bigfoot, they would go out in the front yard of the ranch and they would shoot photographs and i mean they would just burn through 35 millimeter film and then they would go through all the negatives and see if they caught anything and they have photos of fully formed people standing right in front of them in the front yard that were not visible to them and they show up in photos and i i really had never seen anything like that or even heard of that and so the two friends that smelled the bigfoot with me one night they were out here with me a few years later i had taken them out on a ufo tour with night vision and after the tour we were driving back to camp and i said hey you know we should try to go to bradshaw at night so i had my two friends out here who were in the camp that smelled the Bigfoot with me. And this was a couple years later now. I took them out on one of the UFO tours in Sedona with Melinda Leslie. And, you know, we use her military night vision and you see UFOs fly around and stuff like that. And so we were leaving that tour and it was about 11, 11.30 at night. And we were going to pass the dirt road to Bradshaw on the way back to camp. And so we're in my friend's new Jeep Rubicon. And I said, Hey, let's go to Bradshaw. You know, I'd only been there during the daytime. I hadn't been there at night. And, you know, it took him a couple minutes to think about it. I was like, come on, you guys, like nothing's going to happen. I brought my Polaroid. I want us to go down into the front yard and I want to shoot Polaroid shots and see if any people appear in them. And, they were like, yeah, oh, uh, yeah, okay. So these two guys, you know, they thought it was cool to see some UFOs and they thought the smell was interesting, but they're not very proactive into these 
subjects. They don't read up on cryptids and, you know, there's not something they're studying and they think it's interesting, but it's not something they have much passion for. So I did talk them to driving out there and we get out to the ranch and I tell them we're going out dark. I don't want us bringing electronics. We're bringing the Polaroid camera. I'll give each of you a red flashlight, like a red bulb. So it's not so distracting or obvious where we are and we can keep our night vision. So we got there and when you get to the place, you have to walk down this kind of long dirt road to get to the ranch house. So we walk down the dirt road and it is absolute quiet out there. I mean, there's, there's nothing making any kind of noises anywhere. And we get to the front yard. Now they stayed on the dirt road. I was standing in the front yard of the house about 20 feet away from them. And the way the ranch property is, there's a ranch house. There's a small adobe uh, homestead house right next to that. Now about mm, maybe 60 or 70 feet away from the ranch house is a little tiny dry creek that cuts across the property. On the other side of the dry creek are the remains of an Old West movie set. Uh, they filmed like 50 Old West movies out there. Uh, Elvis was in one of them. I think it's called uh, Stay Away Joe. Uh, I, think, I mean, it was, you know, the place to be. If there was a, a Western shot in Arizona during that time frame, you know, they, they shot it out at Bradshaw. And so I take my first Polaroid picture in the front yard. And right after the picture ejects, my two friends are in an absolute panic. They're saying, do you have a light? Do you have a light? Turn it. There's something there. There's something there. And I'm like, wait, what did you hear? Did you hear the camera? And they said, no, over there. And they point past the dry creek toward the movie set. And I said, I didn't hear it. All I heard was the mechanical sound of my Polaroid ejecting the picture. And so I, I walked over to where they are and I said, okay, let's wait. And then I heard it the second time. This thing was standing by the entrance of the movie set. At that entrance, there's kind of like a square shaped wooden gate. You see them a lot on ranches. It's like an upside down U. It's two vertical poles with a, a horizontal pole across the top. This thing picked up a log off the ground like a full-sized log, and it rang it around that gate opening like a dinner bell. I mean, this sounded like somebody trying to start a gigantic engine made out of wood. It was... And my two friends had, honestly, the look of the fear of death in their face. They were panicked, frozen. They said, we need to leave, we need to leave, we need to get out of here, we need to get out of here. I said, whoa, whoa, whoa this is why we came here. I said, just wait, just wait. Don't leave yet. Don't leave yet. I said, I want to go over there. They said, there is no way you're going over there. And I said, it's just over there. And then it did it again. But this time it swung the tree log like a baseball bat into one of the buildings. And I am not exaggerating when I say these are the loudest sounds I've ever heard outside of a construction site in a city out in nature i've never heard anything this loud it sounded like somebody was tearing the buildings down out there even my friend said is there construction equipment over there are there people over there right now doing construction like are they bulldozing that build what's going on and i said no that's it and then it did it a fourth time now between the third and the fourth bashing two of us me and one of them heard like this raging stampede of large animals the third guy didn't hear it he said we didn't say in the moment like hey there's a stampede do you hear it i was listening i heard it after it stopped i was like wow that was did you guys hear the stampede one of them said yeah the other one said i didn't hear anything so the stampede sounded like they were the size of buffaloes. I mean, it was 
not deer. It was something huge. They were, you, you could practically feel it, the vibration of the air, not the ground. You could feel it like in the air as they were circling us. And I couldn't see them. And I said, okay, well, that's good because tomorrow a stampede like that is going to leave just absolute carnage behind it. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures or videos of what stampeding animals do to land and in, in areas, but they, they really make a mess. So I said, we can come back tomorrow and we can figure out what the stampede was. Then we heard it make the fourth noise. The two guys had enough. They said, dude, we are out. I'm He's like, we're in my car. We're leaving. I'm not waiting for this thing to come over here. And I was standing there watching right where the sound came from. Because in my mind, I wanted to know where to go the next morning to look for footprints. So my eyes were focused right on, I kept hearing the sounds from. And then I got to, in air quotes, see it. This thing was looking at us. And it was looking at us over the trees in the dry creek. The dry creek has these trees in it that are 15 feet tall. And its shoulders and head were above those. So this was an incredibly tall creature. Now, Big Girl, the the Bigfoot on the ranch that Linda would interact with the bunch, is like six and a half feet tall. This wasn't Big Girl. But I could see, even at night, I could see the outline of its shoulders and its head. But crazier than that, I could see its eyeballs and I wasn't, we didn't have white lights on us. We weren't using any flashlights, not even the red ones are on. So it's not like this was eye shine. These eyeballs were glowing amber and looking right at me. And I was looking right at it. And then it turned its head. The eyeballs turned to the side and it walked off. Now to describe the way the eyeballs were glowing, because that's a, very vague term that people can take differently. The best thing I can compare it to are those older flashlights that when you would shut them off, the bulb would stay dimly lit for like a couple seconds as it kind of faded out. It looked like that, like these glowing faded lights looking at me. It wasn't like bright lights looking at me. And the next day, I brought the guys back. It was very, very difficult for me to talk the two of them into going back even during the daylight hours. And it didn't help any when we got there because I was finding these 20 inch footprints all in the area where we were hearing the noises. It was just like it, it just showed me this perfect picture. Like I saw this tall creature. Here's its large footprints. You know, we're looking at the, the stuff it was making the noise with. And it just seemed for sure we encountered a giant creature out here. I have thought to myself a lot of times, was it a Sasquatch or was it something else? But when I looked at the footprints, they were more that typical primate footprint. These things had a very, very wide heel, about 20 inches long, you know, like seven inches wide. I can't remember exactly. I have measurements of them, but... You know, a lot of them have a ridge across the middle of the footprint, and it's called a mid-tarsal break. And that happens when uh, humans don't have that because of the way our foot is structured. But a uh, large bipedal primate, it actually has, lack of a better term, something like a hinge in the middle of its foot. So when it takes a step, the front half of its foot is on the ground when the rear half of it lifts up and that creates a separate indent from the front of the foot that creates a ridge across the footprint. And you know, that's what was out there. The stampede ended up being a complete mystery. There was no stampede. There was no evidence of anything. There were a couple tracks that looked like a cow, but there was no stampede by any means at all. I mean, nothing. So the stampede, the noise we heard, it suddenly made sense to us why one guy didn't hear it. It's because there wasn't even really a stampede going on. That night, we thought 
oh, my flash from the camera spooked whatever animals this thing was hunting. The animals stampeded and the creature was mad at us and trying to scare us away by making noise because we scared off its food. But I'm not so sure because there wasn't actually a stampede. So when I had told Tom Dongo about that, he said that there was a film crew out at Bradshaw one time and one of the camera guys had to go pee. And so he went up to like this windmill and when he was there, he said he heard a stampede of horses, like wild horses running around. And when he came back, he was like, hey, did anybody else hear that stampede of horses? And everyone's like, what are you talking about? And you've been gone an hour. So we're not the only people to hear an anomalous stampede out there. So I'm not sure if that's some kind of trick. Maybe the Sasquatch or creature was playing on us. Maybe it's capable of mimicking those kind of sounds somehow to get us to leave. You know, I think most people, if they hear a large stampede of big animals, they're probably going to leave. But also the smell, it doesn't always smell. You know, I've, I've smelled it twice now. But I think that it's probably a gland or something it controls. Like it, it doesn't stink all the time because it's not taking baths. I don't, I don't think the smell is coming from that. I think the smell is actually something it's in control of releasing. Because otherwise, there's times I would have smelled it. Uh, there was a night on the Bradshaw Ranch. I just had one friend with me. We went out late at night so I could shoot photos. And, you know, he's not into this subject at all either. He's like one of my oldest friends. We met in like middle school, you know, my first roommate and all that stuff. And I, I told him like, yeah, come out there with me. And he's like, I don't want to go. And I was like, well, if something happens, I would prefer to have a witness. And he was like, ah, all right, I'll go. And so he was kind of sitting on a wall. I was shooting pictures all around the ranch. And then he was like, yeah, man, I want out. <laughs> And so it's just a creepy place to be. And so we left. When I get home, I go through my photos. And sure enough, big girl let me take photos of her. Now, I didn't see big girl standing there. But she was crouched down right in front of the Bradshaw house. The photo is in the end of the documentary. You can see it. And... I, I was taking kind of panoramic photos. I would take one photo, move my camera over to the left a couple inches, take another. And I took like four or five. And its eye shine was in every shot. Its body, you can clearly see in the main pic, uh, the one we show at the end of the film. And I'm telling you, this thing is massive. They were right. It's about six and a half feet tall because I took my picture crouched down there in front of the same part of the house and it's about my height i'm about six three but it's probably three to four times wider than me i mean this thing has such a crazy bulk to it and it's really tough to argue that there's not a creature in the photograph i mean it's a flash photo from a cell phone at night and this thing was 50 feet away from me Right. So you can't see hair details. You can't really see much detail in the face. This creature was grayish. And oddly enough, Linda Bradshaw said Big Girl was a white Bigfoot. And she knew it was a woman because it had breasts. And I believe at one point it had a child because they were finding tracks of Big Girl with smaller ones next to it. But the creature in the photograph it definitely has a grayish color to it. It's not brown or anything like that. It has a massive head. Its shoulders are like the size of its head. And it's crouched down in an up, like its back is upright, knees are bent, and its arms are down by its side. And it's just sitting there frozen while I was shooting photographs. Didn't smell it. Didn't see it. Now, it could have physically been there. It was a dark night as I was shooting photos. You know, I don't shoot a photo and then move my camera and see, look at the house. And then, you know, I was just shooting photos. So it could have physically been maybe these creatures exist in a way that we don't understand. I'm starting to think they're probably closer to an ET than a large monkey that evolved here on earth that we never found because a large monkey isn't going to be in the mountains of Arizona 
for any reason. I mean, there's just no reason for that to exist out here. And it completely caught me off guard encountering them out here on top of that. And then as years went on, I just keep going to Bradshaw. I've been finding little foot tracks, what looks like it's a smaller creature. The, the other weird thing is I'll find tracks out there that don't have the toes. It looks like it's wearing something on its feet. Uh, I don't know if those tracks are from a Sasquatch creature that has literally put something on its feet, or maybe it's from an ET that is wearing some kind of suit or boots, but they don't have tread marks. They leave impressions, and they're usually deep impressions, like an inch deep, when my track is not even a quarter inch out there. But oddly enough, yeah, the weird they never have any kind of tread pattern to them. And I saw little foot tracks like that on Bradshaw, and then at the petroglyph site, just a couple weeks ago, I got, uh, it's about 16 inches long, I think. This is like 15 or 16 inches long and about two inches deep in the ground, more treadless shoe-like tracks that are anomalous, meaning there's like four. Another weird thing about the Sasquatch creatures out here is they don't have to leave footprints. They'll leave like three or four, and then there's nothing before it, and there's nothing after it. And animals can't do that. I mean, not an 800 or 1,000 pound creature. It's not going to have the ability to just stop leaving footprints when it's walking through the same type of ground material consistently. You know, that's why it's easy to track a cow or something when it's out on Bradshaw because it leaves tracks everywhere it goes. I found a set of footprints out there that were a bit more rectangular, but it was a good two inches deep on a dirt road i mean you're talking about things that cars drive on and these tracks were leaving impressions about two inches deep on a dirt road they have video and pictures of that too and so i'm out here um you know i was coming out here just for camp trips and you know i'd save up my vacation days i actually worked in a hospice uh, I'd save up my vacation days and make a 10 day camp trip out here each year. And, you know, I'd try to just go around and see if I could find anything, get pictures of video. And then I started making two 10 day camp trips a year. And then just July of this year, I actually moved out here. The more time I spent out here, to me, it felt like the way for me to encourage more encounters with these creatures is to let them get familiar with me my intentions and all that kind of thing because i'm pretty sure they can see right through all of us and know exactly what we're doing they know we're in an area before we even know they're there kind of thing i'm convinced every time i go to bradshaw the creatures know i'm there I'll take people there and they'll even people who are skeptics will tell you they feel like they're being watched by a lot of things when they're out on the ranch. And, you know, the human eye can only pick up a small spectrum of the existing range of light. So, you know, it's not really impossible that there are things existing around us that we can't see. And especially when they let themselves appear in photographs. But so, yeah, now I've been able to spend a lot more time out there. And one thing that Linda Bradshaw said, uh, she passed away now, but she said that as her encounters with the Sasquatch big girl became more frequent, like she would leave food, it would respond. Then finally, little girl left her body impression in the soil. And linda could see from the impression that she was pregnant now linda said that she finally realized that big girl left the body impression because big girl was getting ready to actually show herself to linda and it was big girl's way of showing linda the size of her so that linda wouldn't freak out when she saw her and she didn't realize that at the time, but shortly after that, big girl 
let Linda see her in person. And so, you know, as Linda looked back, she was like, it seems like that was a step being taken in order to make the introduction. And so the thing I've gotten a little excited about recently is in the last month, two times now, I've gone out to Bradshaw and in the front yard, there's an imprint in the grass of what looks like a big creature laid down and it's laying down the same way that it did for Linda. Linda said that the creature laid down on the soil and it had its arms on its chest. So its elbows are out to the side and you could see imprints from the butt and you could see an imprint from the belly off to the side. Like it rolled over at one point and left the belly imprint. That's why they thought it was pregnant. And so the imprint I found is, I mean, the grass is completely matted. There's a head, there's a huge body, and there's two triangles coming off the sides where the arms would be. When I first saw it, I thought it had its hands uh, behind its head, like it was laying in the grass looking at the sky. Then I read up some more of some of Linda Bradshaw's notes, and she said the one she saw its hands were on its chest. And when I looked back, that's exactly what this one was. If you look at kind of the angle of how the arms were, it looks like the arms were exactly that, right on its chest, not behind its head. However, the one that left the impressions I found is actually 12 feet tall. I've been bringing tape measures now. So uh, the first time I found it, I was kind of lost for words. I was like, oh my God, look at, look, wait. and then, you know, as I'm looking, I'm like, oh my gosh, there, there's the whole body. There's the, oh, there's the elbows. There's the head. Uh, it was six feet from elbow to elbow and it was 12 feet tall. And it's done it twice now in the last month. So, you know, my hope is that maybe it's the same type of sign that Linda got, you know, that maybe soon enough I can have a chance to actually just let one of these creatures become visible to me in a certain way and that's just one of the things you know this isn't an exact science we have no idea what these things are but i can tell that they know if there are electronic devices around the times i go down into bradshaw with nothing we go in dark weird stuff happens the times we go in with devices cameras and everything like that they will let you catch them on camera on occasion. It's not like they're completely avoiding it, but you don't have the real wild, enc- at least for me yet. You know, Tom Dongo has said that, you know, they don't care about the cameras at all. And, you know, there's been plenty of times he had a camera out there. But a good example is the place where I would find the most footprints on the property. A few months ago, somebody set a trail cam out on a tree that looks at that area. And since they did that, there's not been one footprint in that area. So these things know there's a trail cam there. I found four footprints leading right up to the edge of where the trail cam takes pictures. And then those footprints disappear. And those were big, heavy tracks. I found those three months ago and they're still there now. Yeah. I mean, this thing moved earth when it walked and, you know, due to some of the conditions out here, uh, you know, it's the dry mountains of Arizona, you know, sometimes we get rain, we're even getting a little snow now, but this thing moved dirt when it moved and it compressed it down and squeezed out the sides and it leaves tracks behind for a good amount of time especially around bradshaw one of the things i find a lot is where a big heavy creature walked and it's in a gravelly area and what it does is it pushes the gravel down two to three inches into the dirt and then wind and rain fill those in with silt And so all of a sudden you have this gravelly area with these clean dirt footprints that go through it. And I had to, you know, dig down and realize, oh, it's pushing the dirt down and these are filling in. But you can definitely tell the difference between these big, large creatures walking around out there and horses and cows. And granted, there isn't much activity at Bradshaw. It's in the middle of nowhere, but there is a lot of activity. I mean, not terrestrial animal activity. I've seen cows out there on occasion because BLM land is, you know, they lease it to ranchers who go graze their cattle. But like I said, cows are pretty easy to track. You know, they leave poop and they leave footprints everywhere. They don't disappear and reappear.
there was one evening out there that Tom told me about where there was a room, a little building that was completely sealed shut. And at one point it had been like a general store over by the movie set. So there were some items still in there. And one night the Bigfoot went in and ate like a hundred fireball candies. I mean, it just sat there on the floor. It unscrewed the lid to the jar and it unwrapped the candies and just sat there and ate them all. And they were, they could hear it in there. And the only thing is there's no way in or out of that building. So this thing walked through the wall somehow, uh, sat down in the room and then somehow walked through the wall to get out. And it's because I've been able to come out here and spend so much time and gain experiences and collaborate with some of the other locals and putting together a bigger story of what these things are capable of that has pretty much convinced me these are something higher level than us. I mean, we're the dumb monkey to them for sure. These things are way more capable than a lot of people give them credit for. And I think that's why it's so easy for them to stay hidden away from us. But, you know, the goal is keep trying new experiments out here. I set up a gift exchange a couple years ago and put some items out. Uh, they didn't take any of my items, but they did leave me a big stone on the table. Uh, like it was a size of a large potato and I still kept that. So now that I'm out here, I decided, okay, I'm going to try to up the game on the communication a little bit. And in that room now on that table, I set up a white poster board, some charcoal, and I drew a few symbols on the poster board. One of them is like a stick figure of me and a couple other symbols, an outline of my hand, you know, hoping that they can maybe make marks of their hand or, you know, are they capable of writing or drawing? And really the only action I've got on it so far was I'd go in there and it's knocked onto the ground. And I'd pick it back up and put it back on the table. And it was like the second or third time that it was getting knocked onto the ground that I realized the stick figure drawing I did of me had been rubbed or smeared. The other drawings hadn't, but my picture had been smeared, the charcoal had been smeared. And then it kind of dawned on me that the charcoal sticks I left for them to reply with are incredibly small. I mean, they're these really thin, tiny pieces of charcoal. And I was just like, maybe these things are just frustrated. I'm asking them to write me a message and I left them this tiny little piece of charcoal that they can't even hold in their gigantic hands. And maybe they're just knocking the whole, all the stuff off the table. Because we've checked during windstorms and snowstorms and rainstorms, wind doesn't knock the board off the table. We've sat there and watched it, you know, because we have rocks around the bottom and we made sure it isn't wind. So now I haven't checked on it yet, but the last time I was out there, I got chalkboard paint and I actually painted it on the outside of the building. I got big sidewalk chalk. I drilled a hole in it, put some good gauge thread through there, like thread that you would use to stitch leather, tied it to a, a nail in the building and left some other pieces of chalk there. So I drew a few more symbols. You know, I'm, I'm really hoping at some point that we can get some sort of communication with them because from the time I've been out here, I know for sure these creatures are definitely real. They're in this area, and they've been here for about 10,000 years, at least according to the documentation carved into the walls by the people who lived here at the time. So we're just going to keep gathering footage for Hoodoo Tall 2, you know, expand on everything that we showcased in the first one. The good addition to my little team is this guy named Ben that I met. He's kind of like my Ben Kenobi now. He's, you know, this older guy in his 70s, lives up here in Mingus Mountains, up in the mountains. It rarely comes down. One of the most brilliant people I've ever met. You know, he's been an engineer and a scientist, and he creates his own sensors and equipment to measure strange phenomena. He's been measuring the vortexes around Sedona for years and years and years. And I brought him out to Bradshaw for the first time just maybe a couple months ago. And we took some readings with his equipment in the front yard. And there are gigantic magnetic pulses followed by electrical discharges coming out of the ground on that property. So he's making some new sensors now that'll be able to detect ionization and things like that. But we're hoping that 
the more data we can gather on top of the experiences will add more puzzle pieces and eventually you know we start to get a bigger picture of what this phenomena is or trying to understand it i mean and really the point of understanding it is so we can learn how to interact with it you know i'm not hunting these things out here you know i'd rather prefer a handshake instead of a hunt so you know i bring them food and i bring them other offerings whatever i can think of i don't think any idea is stupid at this point you know i just try things if they don't work then i try something else and i feel like that trial and error will probably just be the best way to lead to some results i know that big girl loves hundred grand chocolate bars and she hates reese's peanut butter it's the weirdest thing i mean i'll put a hundred grand chocolate bar up in a tree and in an hour it'll be gone i have reese's peanut butter cups up there that have been there for six months and nothing's touched them they're still there so it's it's really weird how they pick and choose where and when they leave tracks what they like to eat it isn't a terrestrial animal that we haven't discovered and i think that the more that people can come to that realization i think that's going to help them with encounters some more uh, you know if people try to keep researching this like it's a monkey we're never going to get anywhere because we use say infrared cameras and infrared flashlights out in the woods these things can probably see infrared so i mean they see you a mile away that you're not going to get the jump on them uh, you're going to have an encounter with one it seems like usually either you go directly to the place it's at or it will give you permission to have an encounter with it like when i got the photos of it that was all on it it didn't have to sit there and let me take its photo it seemed like it was letting me take its photo so don't assume that all these creatures behave the same there's just no reason to suggest that i don't have any reason to think they're threatening i don't think they would ever hurt us uh, i don't think that's part of what they are i do think they try to give us a little bit of a scare because quite honestly i don't think they're any of our business I don't think it's like our job to figure out what those creatures are. I think they have their own business. They're conducting it and they prefer to stay enigmatic. So they're not going to let us get the jump on them somehow. You know, it seems like they do let us have plenty of encounters. So it is curious that they, they let that kind of happen. You know, you hear lots of reports of people who see one out in the woods and that Bigfoot just stands there and they just kind of look at each other for like a minute or so. So they seem to be doing enough to let some of us out here know they're real but it doesn't seem like they're trying to go mainstream by any means so yeah if, if i mean if this is something that you're listening to this and the subjects are things that interest you 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 can prove it to yourself for sure and you just need to actually go to some of the places where these things happen and you, you can't just go for a day um you know that's kind of the bummer with some of the tv shows out there where they go investigate a weird location is they go for one night or one day and they're like oh yeah there was nothing here and it's like you gotta put in time you gotta go to these places because you can't be expressing that type of entitlement to these type of creatures i think you really need to have a humble approach to them in order to get some interaction and some results if you come into a place thinking like well i'm here so why don't you show up they're going to be like no and i do think the mindset you take into you know your little expeditions or your hunts whatever you want to call them i do think the energy and mindset you bring does affect the results that come out uh when i bring people out at night to bradshaw you know hoping to have a bigfoot encounter and they're super negative about it i almost guarantee nothing's going to happen but if i bring some people out there who are super excited about it there's a lot of times we get wood knocks back you hear weird whistles and other weird noises out there but like i said it's still trial and error for me you know it's, it's something i'm just going to keep at and i think that if i don't give up out here you know we're going to be able to uncover something at least and be able to kind of contribute to the larger understanding of 
what these creatures are and if there's anything we can learn from them that would be the ultimate goal for me if this is a higher level being maybe there's something we can learn about ourselves from them and mature our souls a little bit that's a big ask but why not give it a shot well that's it for tonight's show if you've had a bigfoot sighting and would like to be a guest please go to mybigfootsighting.com and let us know thanks for listening have a great night seen a bunch of run down no horse towns where the church is the backbone loves in the bow and the five string melodies groove in with the farmland rows where the roots run deep beyond the noise of the busy streets where the songs of the south are soothing when i hear the front porch picking down home rhythm ringing out i don't run from banjo music yeah